So why does an understanding of what an evolutionary agent is help us understand the origin of life, and in particular, the multiple origins of life? And it's worth starting with a case study here. This is Sol Spiegelman, and he was a virologist, and he was in, interested in the evolution of very simple viruses. And the virus that he worked with was called Q betaphage. And this is a very small RNA virus. And he asked the following question. What is the minimum genome that Q beta has to possess in order to successfully complete its life cycle? But he tricked the virus. He put a population of viruses in a test tube along with enzymes that normally it would have to encode itself. But he ensured that those enzymes were always present. And what he observed over multiple replication rounds of the virus in this new environment that he created was that the virus became smaller and smaller and smaller until it eliminated all traces of the enzyme that now existed with certainty in the environment in which it was evolving. So we can interpret this experiment in the following way. Here's a Venn diagram. In one set of the viral genome, V, and another set, the environment, H, the host. And the intersection of these two sets are genes shared by the virus and the host, or the virus and its environment. And what Spiegelman discovered is if you make the environment certain, then the virus minimizes itself. It throws away all genes it doesn't need because they're already there. This is minimality. But he could have performed an alternative experiment and made the environment very uncertain. And when environments are very uncertain, that is, you can't throw things away because you know they will be there, then you have to encode them intrinsically. So a good example for us are vitamins. With respect to vitamins, we're minimal. Because we know they're always there, we don't have to synthesize them. Right? But many other genes, we can't be certain we could acquire from the environment, so we have to encode them and transmit them ourselves. And we call that autonomy. So these are two different configurations for an adaptive agent. Now, many people would call a virus non-living, because it depends on its host to replicate. But, of course, we depend on the environment to replicate, too, because we need vitamins. So really, there is a spectrum of adaptive agency. On the one hand, there are organisms that live in very certain environments, and they become simple. There are other organisms that live in very uncertain environments, and they become complex. They encode more and more in their genomes. And life spans this informational spectrum from organisms that encode very little about the world because they don't need to, to organisms that encode a great deal about the world because they need to complete their life cycle. And when you think about it in this information theoretic term, that what an organism or life or an agent really is, is a mechanism for acquiring adaptive information about the world that it propagates forward in time, then computer viruses, the blockchain, the constitution, and many, many other cultural forms are essentially living. There's nothing special about the biochemical example, a replicating cell, because a replicating cell is simply a somewhat autonomous informational entity that is able to propagate itself forward in time, just like a constitution can. But like a virus, the Constitution requires us. We are the vitamins of the Constitution. And this leads to a very open question that's worth debating. On the one hand, we could be fundamentalist. We could say, look, all of life depends on chemistry, and so finding the simplest chemistry that is capable of encoding adaptive information about the world is where life really started. But another possibility is to say, well, not really. 
Because at any scale that you can find this basic set of mechanisms, you're entitled to call it life. And you're even entitled to call it an independent origin of life. So by analogy, someone might say, to understand architecture, to understand Gothic and Renaissance or Baroque or Rococo architecture, you need to understand quantum mechanics. And I think that would be foolish, because all of them, of course, ultimately depend on quantum mechanics. But it's not the differences in the physics that explain the differences in the architecture. That requires a higher level of understanding. And so the pluralist approach to the multiple origin of life says that at every level, you need to find those unique mechanisms that can support the propagation of information. And there isn't a correct, most basic level. It depends on the question that you're asking and the, and the variation that you're trying to explain.